Uh, my name is Shankar Sivaramakrishnan. Um, I work at the Aditya Birla Group, Group Data Analytics team in Bangalore. We are a team of about 50 people whose charter is to improve the adoption of analytics across the Aditya Birla Group. For those of you who are not introduced to the Aditya Birla Group, this is a $45 billion conglomerate. Uh, it's an Indian conglomerate, uh, which has a bunch of companies in the Nifty 50. So Ultratech Cement, Kindalco, which is known for its aluminum and copper, and Grasen, which is primarily known for its textile businesses, are three of the big brands from the group. And uh, the group's you know, more than 75 years old and uh, really has been trying very hard to transform itself through this revolution of AI and analytics. What we decided for today is, instead of going too much and telling you about what our group does, uh, the Analytics India magazine has done a great job of covering the work that we do in our group. So I've pointed you out to a couple of links. I'll be happy to send them across later as well. But if you Google um, the group data analytics team at Aditya Birla Group, you should be able to find a lot about us. What I thought we'll do today is instead focus on you, which is I'm told you are all a group of young professionals, typically you know, less than five years of experience, and uh, looking to make your journey into the modern world of analytics. So there isn't a one path or a one guideline for you know, a successful recipe. So what I decided to do today is to share with you my journey into modern analytics. And through this journey, I've primarily thought of uh, only three things. One is, how do I build multifaceted skills? There are a lot of different aspects to analytics. Uh, how do I keep learning and augmenting these skills? And how do I stitch all of these different skills together into a career role? So I will walk you through my thought process for how I've done it for myself. And uh, towards the end, we'll contextualize it towards you, which is if you look at the industry as a whole, what are the skill maps that we are seeing in the evolve in the industry? And how do you place yourself in the current industry? And how do you, when you go out into the analytics industry, let's say right now, as well as five years down the line, how do you want to position yourself such that you're looked upon as a, highly valuable resource and somebody that a lot of companies want to hire. So let me start with my journey. So I'm a bachelor's in engineering. I did a bachelor's in materials engineering from IIT Madras and then did a PhD in materials engineering from University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign and then did research in materials engineering for about six years. So totally spent about you know, 13 years of R&D in materials engineering and now I'm in analytics. So a lot of time the question that gets posed to me is how? You know, so I look back at my own career and this is my reflection. What I've done throughout my career is build a set of skills that all add up to the job that I do today. And I'll explain. So early on in my bachelor's days, we were still working on basic, you know, Pascal, Visual Pascal. MATLAB was just getting in uh, at that point of time. It was about learning how to code and being comfortable with coding in uh, different uh, languages as well as, you know, different ways of thinking about how do you define matrices, images, and so on. Once I moved on to my PhD, uh, I did a few things. One was about selective noise removal, which was a kind of a watershed moment for me where I realized analytics was able to help me publish my first paper uh, as a co-author. And through that journey in my PhD, I did a lot of process simulations. I will take you through both of this. Now, some of these have different terms in the world of analytics. I'll walk you through that as well. But this journey landed me into a job as a researcher at GE Research. And as, as I was being a researcher, primarily I was asked to look at a lot of data coming in the form of images and spectrographs and understand what was going on with material systems. To do this, I did a lot of image analysis and was heavily trained in Six Sigma techniques for hypothesis testing. I will walk you through this as well. About 2014, I would say, is probably when I got into modern analytics, when I first uh, encountered Tableau. And uh, Tableau really opened my world up to visualizing multiple databases at the same time, filters, you know, real-time filters, which improved our ability to make decisions on the fly, going from probably an hour to make a decision to probably a minute to make a decision. Uh, since then, I've been a big fan of data visualization, and I continue to be a big user of Tableau. Uh, machine learning for me, the modern form of machine learning started in 2016, uh, where a few of us in our company you know, were encouraged to go ahead and learn, get more into data analytics because of our background. 
and I use that opportunity to do a few courses. I will quickly circle back here. So my journey started off in really learning how to code and then using my skills to analyze small amounts of data, primarily around images. And that image analysis skill led me into a lot of Six Sigma techniques because the analysis was used to make decisions. So we used a lot of t-testing, hypothesis testing, ANOVA, and forward design of experiments and so on. My modern journey into analytics started with Tableau and the visualization power that Tableau presented uh, was an eye opener for me. The hardcore machine learning for me in the modern form happened around 2016. And uh, since 2016, you know, that's an ongoing journey which has been combined with uh, an interest that I have in industrial IoT. So I just wanted to walk you through some of the uh, aspects of how to think about your career journey into analytics. So this I was sharing uh, before the connection got lost, which is a paper that was my first ever published paper that we published. Uh, this was work that I did not do. I was watching a colleague do, and I was seeing that the colleague was trying to measure a small dot here, and the colleague was interested in knowing you know, how the intensity of this dot increased with temperature or decreased with temperature. And in doing so, uh, the, they were not able to extract useful information because there's a lot of noise. So what you see around here is background noise. We realized that a lot of the noise that is present in this sort of a pattern is heavily localized. So the noise that you might see in a region like this was very different from a noise that you might see in a region like this. And we accounted for that difference in variance of the noise and that uh, enabled us to publish this paper. And uh, for me, it was a great moment in understanding the power of analysis. Uh, I did not even collect this data, but just being able to identify what about the data processing could enable us to extract more value out of the data was help, was helping us publish this paper uh, in a peer reviewed article. So today, when I walk away uh, at looking at problems with heteroscedasticity, this is one of those visual images in my mind where I know that you know heteroscedasticity is a key problem where variances are not equal across data sets, and this is something I take away. And as early career professionals, that is something that I think you would build on in your career. There are certain key problems that you would see. Sometimes they leave you with a very lasting impression that enables you to not make the same error as you go forward. This was another key moment for me in analytics. So we used to work a lot on simulating physical processes. Today, that is you know, recoined as digital twins. Digital twin is a great marketing term because it helps a lot of people who are not even into analytics connect with the idea of building a physical model of what might happen in a system using that model, learning with data, updating the model, and redeploying that model. So here what you're seeing is, for example, a gold uh, nanocrystal, which is about five nanometers long. And in this nanocrystal, a certain pattern was being formed. And this pattern did not match the simulations. So the data and the model were not matching. So we further did even more modeling and said, OK, how do I make the data match the model? And Bear in mind, at this point of time, this was about 12 years ago, all of this was done manually. So we would get the data, we would have the model, we would update the model manually. Today, that's done automatically. And today, we build flexible models such that when the model sees new data, it automatically adjusts its parameters so that the model is able to you know, learn. So these sort of learning models, which we call digital twins for physical systems, um, to me, one of the biggest takeaways when I, you know, when I look back at my own career is, it's important to do deep work in in some topics for you to understand the value of things that we don't know. For example, a lot of people that I work with uh, have not deeply modeled physical processes. So uh, they use largely data-based techniques, whereas the folks, some other folks that I've worked with have used simulations on physical processes. So they deeply understand the value of you know, physics and simulation. So it's good to have a deep domain experience as you're considering your you know, analytics career growth, do consider going deep, and I will uh, come back to this point later. This was another important moment for me. This was in my PhD thesis. I was defending my thesis, standing in front of a committee, and I showed this plot, and that red line that you see in this plot uh, was pretty much you know, collected over four years' worth of work, uh, and you know, probably cost the entire group about half a million dollars to collect this data. So it was over 31, the data points and from those 31 data points we had to fit a slope and we said you know we've measured a negative slope 
Now, one of the committee members looked at this and said, boy, there's so much noise in it. What if I knock off one of those data points or a couple of those data points, would your conclusions remain the same? So we had to go back and do a lot of work. And this was one of the early exposures for me into leave one out cross validation. But uh, cross validation itself as a methodology, when you're dealing with small data sets, even large data sets, but small data sets, especially the strategy of cross validation and how do you employ the right strategies to make sure that you're not providing wrong conclusions. The other takeaway for me uh, when I was doing this work was that you know, data science experiments have to be really planned for. So today I spend a lot of time, I will come, touch upon this later as well. I spend a lot of time planning the data science experiments. Now, when I look back at my career, now this was 15 years back, when I, if I had known that I could have collected only 50 data points over a course of three years, the way I collect data would itself would have been different. And a lot of these stopping criterion, you know, a lot of researchers and even analytics professionals like to stop collecting data when the data proves their point. And uh, this is a, one of the big, you know, reasons some people refer this problem in the world of analytics is p-hacking. For those of you who use p-values, so these are the kind of problems that analytics professionals, as you grow in your career, you have to deal with. It's not just about analyzing the data but deciding how you're going to collect data such that the data represents uh, the knowledge that you want to find. The other big thing that happened to me in my career was I had to work a lot with images. So at this point, you know, I would have to deal with images like this and understand the porosity levels, the circularity of the pores, the connectedness, uh, the volume fraction, and so on. Uh, these were done with typically classical image processing techniques such as thresholding, filtering, and so on. Now, in the in the modern days these things can be done with uh, deep learning probably deep learning is a little bit of an overkill if you just want to find porosity levels nevertheless what i find is the there is considerable applications of the techniques we learned in image processing to image augmentation in deep learning now one of the big challenges when it comes to images uh, based deep learning is often you don't have enough images you know typically with text or audio that's not as much of a challenge but with images it's always a challenge so how do i augment the images with different sorts of filtering techniques and i still use some of these old techniques that i've learned to do that the takeaway for early career folks such as yourselves with the phone here is you might learn a certain technology today and you might feel that you know that technology is getting outdated very soon and trust me every one of us in this domain of data science is feeling the pressure of being outdated every day there is something new that's getting released either in data science data engineering visualization that, we, that keeps us on our toes. Nevertheless, my experience has been that even though you might be at the outset feeling outdated, a lot of the techniques and the fundamentals that you learn is always applicable. And it actually makes you stand out in a community because you're not coming in with just the highest level of the latest knowledge, but also um, the lower levels of how do you build that knowledge that you might be able to leverage two things together. Uh, one of the feature extraction examples today, for example, is in text, you know, based feature uh, and deep learning, which is probably uh, NLP, uh, natural language processing. A lot of the natural language processing was based on feature extraction still recently. And, you know, only after these attention networks and so on, there's a lot more, uh, a lot less focus on feature extraction. But uh, feature extraction continues to be a very useful uh, technique, be it in time series, be it in images or in, uh, you know, audio or text data. Six Sigma was also a big moment in my career. So I was forced into Six Sigma because my company mandated everybody that joined to learn Six Sigma and become at least a green belt certified person. And over the time I've worked with several black belts and master black belts. Uh, I used to work on a class of hardware that is used in aircraft engines, which I showed on the left. It's called a high pressure turbine vane and other parts of the aircraft engine. All of them used to have coatings. So I spent a considerable amount of time on these white coatings. They're called thermal battery coatings. And the idea was to figure out how do I improve the life of these coatings? How do I make them cheaper? How do I uh, make sure that the coating lasts as long as I tell the customer that it will last? And these are you know, very highly expensive coatings. And during this process, the process of making stuff, a lot of hypothesis testing was used. And we did a lot of ANOVA, P-test, and COVA, as I mentioned earlier. And early days in my career, I had heavy dependence on frequent test methods. And um, in fact, at that point, nobody had even exposed me to Bayesian techniques. Thankfully, there were a group of colleagues um, who I got to uh, meet and they exposed me to these Bayesian techniques. And these days, I still, you know, Six Sigma is still very much part of what I do because every time we come up with a conclusion, 
the answer is, you know, is this statistically significant? But our reliance on frequentist methods have come down. We've augmented it with Bayesian techniques. About 2016, uh, had to move into machine learning uh, because the modern machine learning world had really caught up. And um, I primarily used my background to work on just online resources. Now, I wouldn't recommend online resources exclusively for early career folks such as yourselves. I think getting a full-fledged degree, even if it's a six-month degree, is certainly useful. But as you saw in my career, because of my training and my doctorate thesis work, I had built a lot of those foundational blocks for myself. So I was comfortable in getting myself educated through an online degree. So I went with the Introduction to Statistical Learning course from the Stanford team of uh, Trevor Hastie and Robert Shirani, who were both considered very strong frequentist statisticians. And I've since augmented myself with some Bayesian techniques with uh, Professor John Trushke's courses. And uh, Professor John Trushke is again considered one of the strongest professors in Bayesian techniques. Recently, uh, I've not had that much of a need to get into deep learning, primarily because the data sets I've been working with have been small data sets. So I, I've had to tackle more of the small data problems than the big data problems. That has caught up to me now. Uh, big data has caught up to me. So I have. I uh, started investing much more time into deep learning, though I'm definitely no expert in uh, deep learning at all. Lastly, I think my journey stops um, before the Aditya Birla group uh, in industrial internet of things. So I had an opportunity to work with the GE Predix asset performance management team. We did a lot of work in trying to assess the health of um, assets such as you know pumps, motors, gearboxes in industrial factory floors with industrial IoT concepts. So getting data from sensors is a massive time series data set and using multivariate techniques to figure out if there is an anomaly, what is the remaining useful life, uh, how much reliability uh, do I have left in this particular asset. So with that, I moved on to the job I have today, which is in the Aditya Birla Group. I'm a practice leader. I look after three sectors in the Aditya Birla Group, which is chemicals, textiles, and carbon and manage all the analytics and interventions that we are putting into these sectors. I've just drawn a tree map to give you an idea of you know, a day in the life of uh, somebody like me. Uh, it's got a couple of colors here, uh, four colors. So all the dark blue colors are places where I'm applying data science, uh, my true data science knowledge. Anything that is blue, I'm doing more of a consultative role. And I'll touch upon this again. Uh, anything that's orange, uh, these are domain uh, knowledge pieces which are not directly related to data science but uh, enabling connecting the dots between a business problem and a data science problem um, and then finally i do very little bit of data engineering i show this kind of a map for you because i think there are primarily four roles that's evolving in analytics industries this does not include industries which are doing product development and in product development industries we might want to uh, rename the bottom right and i'll explain why quickly see data science uh, i feel is just one aspect of the analytics industry where you know you learn about regression classification time series and so on data engineering is another big aspect where you're building pipelines to take data science models into real life and this involves understanding cloud microservices containers and so on there is a huge piece that comes with domain knowledge and i urge uh, those of you who are not in product companies and who are going to be in companies like Aditya Birla or let's say you work for any of the analytics consultant firms, you need to develop domain knowledge in at least one domain. It could be in engineering, you know, it could be in marketing, it could be in finance, banking, whatever, because the ability to connect the dots between the business problem and converting that into an analytics problem requires domain knowledge. Lastly, uh, for folks such as myself uh, who are not in product companies or heavily product companies, consulting skills is a very important aspect where you're able to talk to the customer, understand truly amongst the several problems where they have, what is the value of the most important problem that you have to solve, understand when you have to build versus buy, uh, able, be able to assess competitors in a, you know, empathetic, you know, in a, a neutral fashion, be able to present your work. So consultative skills are a very important part in the analytics industry today. If you're probably in a product company, instead of consultative skills, you might want to consider more developing product management skills where, again, it, it is consultative in the sense that you're come talking to the customer, getting a lot of inputs from the customer, and then translating the, all those inputs into a couple of key technical requirements that your team will then go off and build. So in this kind of a map, if I look at myself today, what do I do today? Um, I spend most of my time using my domain skills to design how we're going to do the analysis, 
this is exactly what I was saying, referring to you before, where if I know I can do only 50 experiments, and that 50 experiments itself will take me a year's worth of time, how will I do it versus if I know I can do 100,000 experiments in, in, let's say, three months, I would do it very differently. So I spent a lot of time working with the team on designing the analysis and agreeing on what the loss function would be that we would use as the metric to measure success, and as well as you know the techniques, so that you know there are infinite number of techniques out there. How do we prioritize which one to work on first? Personally, I conduct analysis. Uh, if you know, so every one of this I've marked it as zero to hundred percent, where hundred percent is the person in our flow who's doing it all the time, and then how much would I be spending versus that person? I, I conduct analysis maybe four to five hours a week. Um, you know, eight hours a week would be great, but most often it is to just ensure that some of the analysis done by others are correct, and sometimes to explore new libraries that are out there. So just to make sure I'm hands-on. And this is something that I would offer that all of you should think about in your careers. Do you want to do this or not? Because there are two schools of thought. As you grow in your career, perhaps at your, my age, where you're you know, 16, 17 years into your career, you may want to do none of this, spend most of your time on leading and growing teams. But I've said to myself that unless I keep coding all the time, it's very hard for me to help the team come up with the right strategies in the design phase. So. Um, this is my own philosophy, but each one of us has different philosophies as you grow later in your career. I spend very little of my time building pipelines uh, because data engineering is not something I understand very well. And most of my work here is just explaining to our data engineers what we need from a customer perspective. And this is one area I'm <clears throat> looking at the grow growth opportunity myself. I spend almost um, as much time as anybody on the floor uh, helping our businesses adopt the work we've done, communicating with them, understanding what capability issues they have on their side to catch the analytics work that we are building on our side after go live helping them you know support the initiatives and making sure they're able to use the products to the best of their abilities lastly over the last few years i've grown into more of a leadership role where i do people management recruitment presenting in external forums like this mentoring uh, younger people thinking about uh, analytics careers now, if this is how I spend my time in AVG DNA. Uh, I'm thinking about how would uh, early career data science professionals spend their time. I think most early career data science professionals spend a lot of time conducting analysis, learning how to design analysis, and learning how to integrate into pipelines, and you know just uh, slowly getting to understand how to do stakeholder management and how to enable your customers adopt your solution. So one, you are satisfied that your work is actually going somewhere, and two, your investors or your business leaders understand that you know, the work that you're doing is actually getting into production. Now this could flip if you are a data engineering professional. If you're a data engineering professional, the yellow bars would be 100%, and the blue bars would probably be only 10 or 20%. Now, my last slide here, so we keep on time, is if you are considering an analytics career, let's say, you're not yet into the career or you're very early stages of your career and thinking about how do you grow. My suggestion is you want to build a deep foundation and grow deep in a one or two areas. It could be time series, it could be computer vision, it could be NLP. In the first five years, don't spread too thin. You know, become good at one thing, you know, technically. And this could be also in data engineering. It could be, you know, either you're doing cloud or you're doing UX, whatever it is, become very deep at that because you'll be branded and known for that. I also understand one domain. Is it be it banking or engineering or marketing? Don't switch too often between domains. So uh, when you switch from marketing into engineering into finance, you really don't get to learn any one domain. Along the way, learn to become a good project manager so you're able to uh, deliver on the right scope at the right cost within the right time. After like about, I would say, six, seven years, start to learn adjacent domains. This could be both in you know, technical domains and non-technical domains. So make sure that you're uh, able to get the best of other domains into your core domain. And the last piece here, which is very important to me, is continuous learning. Uh, this is a very, very fast-moving industry. Continuous learning is the only way all of us keep up. Okay. With that, I'll wrap up uh, our session. Hopefully, we're on time. Yes. And thank you again for showing up on a Saturday to learn. I hope this was of some value to you. I will stick around till the end of uh, the other two speakers' conversations, and then we'll have uh, some question and answers. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Shankar. It was really insightful uh, talk, and uh, thank you once again for taking our attendees uh, through your journey uh, in analytics.
So, uh, folks, uh, uh, I would like to now hand over the session to uh, Mr. Sandeep uh, from Microsoft. Uh, Mr. Sandeep, uh, I'm just uh, making you the presenter, and you'll be able to now uh, share your uh, slides to our audience. Over to you, sir. Thanks, Shankar. It was very insightful. Uh, I'll take uh, the last cue where Shankar left, continuous learning. Uh, I'll, I'll uh, take it off from there in terms of um, how do you actually uh, stand out as a technical leader in the modern world? I think that's the bulk of my talk. Um, just for information, I am uh, an ISB alum and uh, I finished uh, my post-graduation at ISB uh, a year back or so. So bulk of what I'm going to speak is my journey in the last uh, 18 months or I would say 24 months in, 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 in uh, totality. Uh, what was my life before, what happened at ISB for me and post that. But before that, um, I've spent about 22 years in the industry uh, and I've kind of seen uh, various phases of how technology has evolved, how industries has evolved. And I'm going to bring in a bit of that experience into the discussion today. Uh, and I'm going to share my perspective in terms of if you aspire to uh, become a tech leader, if you're not, uh, or if you're a technical leader, how do you stay relevant and sustain that momentum in the industry. Uh, I'm going to bring in that perspective and eventually move towards establishing why is academic intervention so essential in, in the modern world. Okay, so this is a bit of a very short introduction from my end. Uh, bulk of my work, um, what I do at uh, Microsoft, I head the Microsoft Technology Center. Um, I was talking about what does it take for one to stay relevant and what are the ingredients that is essential for us to build it as we go along. Right. Um, in that context, um, the first thing I wanted to present was yes, industry and personalities, not individuals. Um, this is this is true in terms of. By the way, uh, while I put these as my personal personal opinion perspective, uh, I get to meet a lot of leaders every single day at at Microsoft Technology Center. I will learn a lot from them, um, and I also get to meet individuals uh, in terms of we evolving our strategy and technology at Microsoft in terms of looking at who else, uh, uh, which, which are the leaders we should probably engage and, and drive that motion forward. And also in terms of looking at hiring as a next big thing, right? So might get to meet a good number of people on a week basis. So uh, hence, in, in my perspective, uh, individuals will, will find it hard to, to um, to strike gold going forward. When I say individuals, these are the folks who have certain skills for sure, uh, and they're probably at the stage where they question in themselves saying, what next, right? If that question comes to your mind, uh, that's the time you have to look at probably building your personality. So truly in the current times, um, where when it's a current time, I'm talking about if you want to stay relevant for the next five years, 10 years, I think time has come for us to literally build personalities of ourselves, not really individuals. Individuals making a cut will be very difficult going forward. Um, second, uh, in, in the you know when, when you talk about what right so future proofing ourselves is so critical right um, when I say industry relevance uh, we always use a term called thought leadership trusted advisors etc those are the terms that we talk about but how many of us qualify as thought leaders in the current times and going forward um, hence future proofing ourselves is absolutely essential this is this is probably uh, an area where it elevates each of us in our own construct. Uh, to offer value thought leadership on the table. So future proofing is, is one of the what part of uh, the ingredients required as you go along. Now, of course, you know, the, the most important one is, uh, you know, for the next, you know, we all talk about uh, staying relevant for the long, longest time. So we say five, 10 years, but uh, none of us know how industry is going to shape in the next uh, five to 10 years. We have a glimpse or inkling in terms of, yes, these are the trend that is shaping uh, the technology world, but it's essential for each of us to surface clarity. Right. When I say career horizon, can I can I um, reimagine uh, my career and see where I land up in the next two to three years? Very very essential. So I think when it comes to the what part of it, uh, in terms of what ingredients, yes, one is industry requires personalities or individuals. Right. Number one. Number two, of course, you know the clarity of thought in terms of how you wish to shape a career is very very essential. And as I mentioned earlier, future proofing yourself to make sure. Um, the skills that you possess today uh, or skills that you acquire going forward will make you relevant for the next decade or so. So switching directly in terms of why, why are we speaking about so much of uh, so much of a need to uh, you know, revive ourselves, I would say refresh ourselves in that context. Uh, Shankar mentioned in the last slide in terms of uh, continuous learning. I think more than ever, in my view, that is essential in each of our careers. 
now evolving industry couple of uh, uh, thoughts here right uh, the trail ahead if you look at the how industry is transforming in the in, in for the for the current decade uh, we all are fortunate uh, to be working in diverse teams it's only going to magnify from here on when i say diverse teams people you know you know i i must admit in my team at microsoft technology center um, we have people uh, who are 25 years of industry experience on a, on an average and we also have people who've just joined from their college right um, that's that's a diversity of documents in terms of thinking and today um, the experience is just a number it is about maturity that one shows at the table that's probably defines um, how much of uh, how much of intervention you can make in in progressing any 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 discussion for that matter so experience is a number in my view so maturity so i mentioned earlier in terms of um, uh the trail ahead for all of us i think it's important that we understand this really well um diverse teams of course i'm sure you heard me earlier but i'm going to reiterate this once once again um not to eat too much into this um diverse teams yes all of us uh, will be fortunate to be working in the era where uh, teams will get diverse in terms of thinking perspectives experience level etc uh tech intensity of course it's a dark me as we speak um, what it really means is if you look at technologies like uh, iot blockchain ai uh, quantum computing they all evolving uh, absolutely at, at 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 a fast pace and and uh, more than more than any other times we're seeing all of them coming together brilliantly i think it's almost like puzzle getting formed so in that context it's we are all uh, fortunate to be in this time it's a great time to be in the industry in that context and what what is uh, the crux of the foundation here is uh pace of innovation is truly truly at a, at its uh, at its act in that context uh trail ahead is definitely challenging but i would say interesting right it brings in a lot of uh, diverse perspective into each of our careers and that makes it interesting as well so now how to stay relevant we talk about how part of it this is probably is crux of my uh, talk in that context um there are three aspects here of course all of us know acquire skills uh, when it comes to when shankar mentioned continuous learning it's absolutely about acquiring skills on a regular basis um and acquiring skills all of us do it for sure uh, we also work towards building a personas and personality and extend but end of the day for us to literally demonstrate relevance i think all these things have to come together acquire skills build a personality and eventually your relevance is felt by the industry or individuals in in in, in the industry or your company now let's look at um what probably in my view one of the best way to address building your personality and even demonstrating relevance so academic intervention in my view is probably supreme in in the current times in terms of ensuring uh, you take a break um from from regular routine and understand where the industry is heading and probably bring in an academic intervention to fast track your learning right um you know there are multiple channels to learn in my view you know there's no one particular channel that probably is perceived to be the best form of acquiring knowledge no that's not true but in my personal opinion when i underwent an academic intervention myself uh, you know when i took up my uh, you know business analytics program at isb uh, it changed my uh, life in various ways i'm going to talk about that but if you're if you're looking at fast tracking you're learning if you're looking at fast tracking your personality i'm not even talking career here by the way right career is a reflection of you know, who we who we are and you know, what you'll be going forward but i'm purely talking about elevating your personality and persona uh, academic intervention becomes central to that right um, let me just take you through in terms of what has been my life during and after um, isb this this is something which uh, has been a defining moment in my career so far um, before i took up um, you know the program in isb the question that came after spending 18 years in the industry right the question that came up to my mind was hey uh you know i'm going to be uh, relevant in the industry i'm not even talking about the company by the way you know each of the company if you're relevant for the industry you'll be more than relevant for your company right i'm purely talking from industry standpoint will i serve in the industry for the next decade or so um can i sustain my leadership right as as a leader will i be looked up to by rest of the company in terms of what i bring to the table i think these questions kind of you know um, were 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 hitting me time and again and that's when i i sought academic intervention and when it's academic intervention yes i explored quite a few programs and i felt um early it was called uh, you know certificate uh, uh, you know business analytics program so now it's called ampba um now if you look at it i think during um during the program which is 18 months long uh, it was definitely a defining moment in my career in my life, i would say professional life it was truly a personality makeover for me personally i would probably put that as a term because see each of us acquire skills in various may various ways and means for sure but what happens when you when you dedicate your time and energy uh, in a classroom 
right which is rhythmic which is structured which brings so much of uh, relevance to your uh, you know day job and uh, your your you know, personality as such so what are the differentiated here for me personally while i say personal makeover yes the curriculum is probably forward looking right we our times tend to learn here and now but can you can you probably take a dip into something which will help you understand the perspectives for the next five to ten years i think that's important um, and the best part of uh, the program was the fact that it was hybrid program that means uh, we always went back six six every six weeks we went back to the campus and spent five days i think i think in, in 18 months i always look forward to that moment because that actually makes you grounded right when you're actually sitting in a classroom of 60 people and and um, there are two sex sec sections there and you interact with your peers and you network with them you actually realize man there's so much to learn we always stay in a bubble saying i know so much right um, hence i think that bubble broke for me big time so when i say personality makeover it is about the fact that i could interact with 60 other like-minded folks who bring in so much of uh, intellect to the table and i could learn and of course staying in campus living there brings in so much of uh, uh, it brings it's so much you know it, it actually makes you grounded because in the corporate world uh, we live in an aura where yes i know abc and i'm a leader etc but to go back to academic world um, it actually makes you understand that there's so much to learn and the ramp is, is longer than you always thought um, and of course you know what makes it even what made it unique for me was um, you know definitely the faculty uh, were world class and i you know you could look up uh, you could look up um, uh, the internet for their their, their, their profiles and persona so uh, they brought so much to the table right and uh, these are practitioners by the way most of uh, folks who teach at isb they're actually practitioners that means you know they probably will take it to reality more than anybody else i think that's very important in the current times and uh, it was 18 months of uh, you know fast track learning and life after isb yes of course um, you know i'm not even talking about yes you'll have a new career etc that's something which is subjective i would say but uh, it was it was something which probably uh, the world is open doors for me. I mean, in terms of my personality makeover that happened there, I, I still call personality makeover, you know, in terms of uh, what um, it gave me on the table. But uh, that's my perspective. But uh, of course, you know, that gave you new perspective, new outlook towards industry and life in general, uh, which which made me, uh, you know, where I am today in that context. Um, as I say, establishing personality is no easy task. Uh, you definitely have your skills. You no know, expertise that you build over the period of time aspirations grow as you go along we build strengths and social voice i think all these things is something which which the program gave me as core ingredients for me to build my persona and eventually that's visible that should that should be made visible right end of the day today uh, we live in a world where um, your personality is visible across your personality is sought after by people who want to probably talk to you communicate interact with you and in that context you need you need that construct where you can build this an academic in intervention is probably the best way today to make that happen i think 12 to 18 months of anybody's time is worth it when it comes to such programs now i said earlier um, you know while you require all these things for you to literally get that personality make academic intervention um, while you acquire skills i think number two number three in terms of personality and relevance uh, it can only come your way if you invest in academic uh, in, you know today uh, learning online all the stuff will continue for the rest of your lives but you need that pit stop where you can go on and reflect on on, on each of our uh, learnings and move on from there right i would probably pause here i think for all of us while i'm coding data science as one stream depending on what interests you i would say data science is something which probably be central to everything we do going forward so i think it's time to take the next big leap i'll pause here thank you so much i'll hang in uh, uh conference till the session ends for q a but otherwise i'll pause here my apologies for all the technical glitches uh, back to you pradeep thank you thank you sandeep thank you for taking us through that uh, informative uh, session uh, so up next, folks, uh, we have uh, Vijay Vijay Nair. Uh, as I've uh, introduced Vijay, he's director uh, of Analytics Center for Excellence at uh, the Sink here in Bangalore. Um, and uh, I'm just going to make Vijay the presenter. Over to you, Mr. Vijay. So uh, first of all, folks, thank you very much. Uh, like the other speakers were mentioning, uh, for turning up on a Saturday morning and listening to us. Uh, really excited to be speaking to you, uh, and I'm I'm going to slightly shift gears and talk about an industry which uh, which has been a very very interesting industry. Whether you look at the U.S., whether you look at India, and 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 that's basically retail, and that's where I've spent majority of my career in. Uh, and I, as I was thinking about this talk, I was thinking about what do I speak about in retail, uh, and I kind of finally narrowed down to this topic, which is uh, why physical retail is more interesting than digital retail. Uh, and then, you know, to put a philosophical spin to this, 
uh, you know, if you remove the word retail too, uh, I believe in general in life, physical is more interesting than digital. I'm sure you would agree with me that a cup of coffee with a school friends, uh, you know, far better than just a, a connection on Facebook or Instagram or whatever, right? Anyway, so diving into the topic, um, yeah. yeah. So just before I dive into the topic, I'm going to set some context in terms of the company I work in and the industry in general, right? So I work for this company called Lowe's. Uh, Lowe's is the world's second largest home improvement retailer. Um, we are the eighth largest retailer in the U.S., have about 2,200 stores spread across U.S., uh, Fortune 50 company, $72 billion revenue. Um, and in terms of customers, we have about 80 million customers shopping with us, an average of $100, $150 every week. So if you're interested in big data, there's probably very few companies that offer much bigger data than what we're talking about here, right? Uh, and, you know, Lowe's has a tech and an analytics center based out of Bangalore. Uh, so we are currently, I mean, if you think of the analytics team globally, we're about uh, 400 folks based out of East Coast as well as India. And uh, in India, in Bangalore in particular, there are about uh, 220 folks, uh, you know, spread across analytics, data engineering, um, master data management, uh, MLAI, uh, you name it, we have it here, right? And we are growing. So with that said, uh, you know, going back to the topic in terms of why physical is more interesting than digital, uh, you know, if you look at a lot of news around the internet, um, a lot of us are, you know, carried away by articles that basically say consumer interest is shifting online. Uh, most of the courses on data, data science, ML, AI talk about, you know, the great stuff that Amazon or Instagram or all of those online uh, leaders have been doing. Um, but the reality is this, right? So if you look at large retailers, uh, take Walmart, take, uh, take Lowe's, take Home Depot, take whatever it is, the amount of sales that kind of come from the online only channel is about 10 to 15 percent at the moment and this is mckinsey's study to basically say that even by 2030 best case estimate is that physical stores will still account for 66 percent of overall sales i uh, put in another way uh, we believe that you know physical stores will still be a destination for customers in the future and therefore, from an analytics perspective, it opens up a lot of opportunities in terms of what can be done, right? Um, now, if you don't believe me, if you don't believe McKinsey, I have three use cases to prove why physical retail, for example, is so much more of a challenge and probably an unexplored domain even now, uh, whereas online is sort of done and dusted. I believe, yes, there are definitely more opportunities in terms of improving online retail. But, you know, if you look at the physical retail domain, there's probably far, far more that we can do. And I'm going to kind of prove it through sort of three use cases over here, right? So use case number one, right? Uh, so price. So price is probably one of the most important aspects of uh, aspects that retailers kind of think about. Uh, so let's talk about the digital space first. Now the digital space from an analytics perspective, uh, the thing that digital retailers like to do all the time is price discovery through continuous testing. Uh, so you'd have heard multiple instances of retailers like Amazon changing prices continuously in order to figure out what's the right price they should be offering you so that A, they can maximize their profit and B, from a customer perspective, you keep returning back to them uh, thinking that they're offering possibly the best possible price. The point I'm making here is you can continuously change prices online uh, and continuously learn and iterate on that basis. But if I shift to the physical store environment, right, there are two or three big challenges. One is it is not easy to dynamically change prices in store. Um, reality is uh, you talk of the most developed economies like the US, UK, etc. We still suffer with the concept of uh, physical labels in store, right? Uh, to give you an example of Lowe's, uh, we change only about 200 prices or we have the capability to change only about 200 prices a day in store. And we have about on average about 70 to 80,000 items in store. And the reason we, we can't change as many prices is simply because someone has to physically take that physical label and stick it on over there in our shelves. 
and the cost of doing that is roughly about one dollar per price change right so think about price discovery by continuously changing prices it is way too expensive for a physical retailer to do it the second thing is think about it uh, you know the whole premise of machine learning and all that is you iterate over time and you learn what is probably the best thing to do but the challenge with physical retail is uh, even if you want to learn over a period of time you've got to be very very right in terms of your experiments because let's say the pricing analytics team comes up with a solution in terms of what the prices should be the store operators who ultimately sort of agree on the price changes in store have very limited patience in terms of this test and learn right so they're always pushing back on us to say look it is ex expensive to do it it is time consuming to do it so therefore your models have to be a lot more accurate right at the start and therefore it's much more challenging you know from a physical retail perspective another example of that is if you think of pricing analytics the base of any pricing and analytics is this concept called elasticity which i'm sure everybody would have read about in your in your college days right so the whole idea is you understand the impact that price has on the sales volume demand etc now the point is in order to understand elasticity you've got to have a significant number of price changes to understand what's the impact of price on demand or vice versa right now the point is if there are not enough price changes happening and and just to give you an idea there are thousands of items we sell at lows for example that doesn't see a price change for several weeks right so the whole concept of elasticity which is used to understand how do we increase sales through the change of prices is we don't have that information simply because we don't run such trials right so the problem becomes much more interesting and challenging for us so we use various techniques like for example imputation bootstrapping you name it uh, in order to understand what might be the right elasticity right so from an online perspective the point i'm making it it's it's easier to do price discovery offline perspective it's much more challenging and therefore it's a much more interesting problem to solve from a physical retail perspective so that's number one, which is in terms of price. Number two is uh, this whole concept I wanted to take in terms of recommendation, right? So uh, the example that everybody talks about online and in all of these data and courses is, is the fact that if you buy a shirt, you're suggested a trouser. If you buy a paint, you're suggested a paintbrush and so on and so forth. So this is item to item recommendation, right? And, you know, Amazon has done a phenomenal job of, uh, you know, uh, suggesting the right recommendation and if i'm not wrong the statistic is that you know for if for every 100 recommendations they make about 37 percent recommendations are actually leading to a conversion which is a fantastic conversion rate from that perspective right now think about physical retail right uh, how do we really make recommendations so think about it if you walked into a physical store uh, would you like a person following you all the time and depending on every product that you put into the basket come and interrupt you to say sir why don't you buy this and sir why don't you buy that and so on and so forth uh, beyond just privacy concerns and stuff like that is just irritating if somebody were to do that it's just not practical now the more creative among you might think you know let's put cameras in store uh, let's do facial recognition identify the customer and maybe give them i don't know a pamphlet or whatever it is at the front of the store to entice them to certain discounts and stuff now there's privacy concerns over there right and and most retailers have not been given the permission to do exact facial recognition to identify the customer and to get them offers so there are various challenges in order to do it so think about that problem and think about how you can be creative and and I, what i want to talk about here very very quickly is how given that context we were creative about how we solve the problem right now if you think about lows and you think about home improvement essentially we are in the business of selling anything and everything you need for either constructing your house renovating your house or decorating your house right now what we did was to monitor your purchases over a period of time as you walked into a store or as you purchased online so simple example being if you bought a kitchen cabinet if you bought a kitchen shelf if you bought a faucet the idea is that you probably most probably are renovating your kitchen right now that is super valuable information to us simply because an average basket or an average recommendation of an item in store probably leads to an impact of hundred dollars per customer but if you were to take the same customer and convert them into a project customer which is you know either renovating your kitchen or your house your toilet name it what 
you then become a $15,000 customer to us, which is far more valuable. So we did an entire project on this uh, concept called part to purchase, which is to track your transactions, use survival modeling and sequence modeling to understand what project you might be doing, what is the time that you might be purchasing the next particular product, and then sort of bombarding you with emails to say, look, you can, you can purchase all these products that might be useful for your project. But at the same time, we also offered them free services for someone to come into their house and actually redesign the project. And this saw significant, significant sales uplift, right? So here's one where, you know, something that we wanted to replicate from an online perspective, we really couldn't exactly replicate the same thing in stores, but we improvised on it. And that, that turned out to be very, very useful for us, right? Uh, example number three, right? So, uh, so think about the website that you go to, right? Uh, the concept of digital space. So this is the Lowe's homepage, for example. And, uh, you know, we could do a lot of things from a space perspective uh, or a real estate perspective. So the whole idea over here is that you could decide what products to feature on the homepage versus what products to feature in a promotion page. Um, you could decide what information to provide on a product page uh, simply because, and you can improvise over time simply because we understand where customers actually click, actually view, how do they interact, what is the dwell time, uh, how much time do they take to make an average purchase, etc. So you've got very, very rich information, which leads to some really sophisticated analytics from a digital perspective. Now translate that into a physical perspective, right? So in a physical store, it's very hard to do that. Now, again, retailers have tried all sorts of things, which is basically, you know, putting cameras and tracking movements, anonymizing it because of privacy concerns and stuff like that. But there's hardly any retailers out there, including the top ones that have really, really cracked this problem. So how do we, how do we address this problem in a more traditional way? is that first of all, we do something called store personalization and like customer personalization, right? So what we do is understand, you know, the demographics of the store, um, you know, the type of customers that visit that store, uh, all sorts of other variables that go into store and then determine what sort of products might sell there in order to maximize sales, right? Step number two is then we do this huge exercise around macro and micro planning. So the whole concept of macro planning is that if you sell categories like lighting, uh, paint, uh, electrical, hardware, et cetera, et cetera, the concept of macro space is that given the limited real estate that you have, how do you plan your shelves so that you can maximize sales. So how many shelves do you dedicate it to, let's say lighting versus paint versus hardware versus whatever it is, right? And that's a, that's a huge exercise in itself in terms of optimization, right? And then the next perspective is micro space planning. Now why micro space planning is so very interesting from a physical perspective is you've got to think of adjacencies. So what is adjacencies? So, you know, putting snacks next to beer is a good example of an adjacency because you know both of them are sold together. I don't want to go into that infamous example of, you know, beer and diapers for whatever reason. Apparently the logic was that, you know, men who came into store to purchase diapers also purchased beer because they were so frustrated. But that's that's another example of weird adjacencies. So adjacencies for us are ex extremely important from a micro planning perspective, right? And, and micro planning, again, think about it in terms of what should be kept where and how many facings of the product should we show? How do we think about the navigation of the customer as he enters store, moves, let's say, into, uh, I don't know if you take a traditional retailer, moves, let's say, into the grocery aisle versus the frozen aisle versus, let's say, the, the, the vegetables and the fruits aisle and so on and so forth, right? So those aspects become extremely interesting and we don't have the luxury of online data. So therefore, you know, your statistical and your more classical approaches make much better sense in terms of solving the problem rather than digital, right? So those were the three use cases in terms of, uh, you know, my pitch around why physical store analytics is far, far more exciting and challenging rather than digital. I'm sure, uh, you know, my friends from the digital world like Flipkart and all that would disagree with me, but here's, here's my case on why 
you know, a lot of you, if you're starting off young in your career and you're interested in retail, should be spending a lot of time in physical stores. Even given the landscape of India, 90-95% of your know, retail is still within the physical stores that you need to go after, right? And, you know, what I wanted to do is kind of wrap it up with kind of talking about what are the four essential skills. And, you know, my previous speakers kind of spoke about this, but I just wanted to summarize it for you. The four things that you need to pick up as a data science professional, according to me. So the first thing is, is your hard skills. So for example, the problem solving, the math and the stats, right? Uh, now, like the first speakers mentioning, it's extremely important to have depth in this. And, and this is why, for example, you know, courses like the ones that ISP take is far better than, let's say, you know, the courses offered where you can learn big data in 15 days, you know, you have notices all over the place and stuff like that. So it's not about learning how a piece of code runs on Python. It's about learning how, let's say, for example, regression works in detail, k-means works in detail. Because what organizations value at the end of the day is not about how you run a single piece of code, but how you can add up you know, adapt this algorithm to the business situation to bring the best possible results. And therefore, depth is important from that perspective, right? The second part of it is tools and programming. And the advice over, I have over here is, you know, these tools and programs keep changing over a period of time. And I make this infamous joke that, you know, when I started off in my career, Python was still a snake. Uh, and now Python is a programming language, right? And I still survived. Now, it doesn't mean that you, you be loyal to a programming language, be, be completely flexible in terms of what needs to be picked up. And understand algorithmic skills, they are much better than understanding just programming skills, right? Having said that, I truly believe it's more than just the math and the engineering that kind of enables you to be successful in your careers. There's two other things, and you know, the previous speakers touched upon it, I'll, I'll kind of stress the same thing once again. See, at the end of the day, as analytics professionals, we are at best great influences. We are not necessarily the people with the final decision-making authority, right? So at best, we are influencers. So we've got to influence people in that business, right? Now, if we don't talk their language, which, which in other words put is, if we don't understand that domain, Chances are they're not going to listen to us in terms of whatever solution that you have, irrespective of the fanciest algorithm that you use in the package. So it's important to speak their language, or in other words, it's important to really understand their domain in detail. And the fourth bit of it is storytelling, right? Now, uh, and that's probably a skill that a lot of the technical guys kind of lack in the modern world, right? So they might be fantastic at their programming. They might be fantastic at understanding algorithms and applying it to the business situation. But if they are not good at taking something complex that they have delivered and explaining it in the simplest possible way to the business, most times I've seen these projects end up as academic exercises rather than projects that are implemented in real life. So the final tip I would leave you with is storytelling, right? And, you know, like Sandeep was mentioning, the course at ISB for me particularly was a good mix of all of this. We went into the depth of the algorithms, we learned programming languages, but more importantly, we were given domains to kind of explain and explore in terms of the problem solving and we understood the depth of the domains. That really makes a difference as compared to a lot of the other courses that are offered over there. Right. And with that, uh, I know we are running short of time, so I'm going to end it here. I'm going to be available for Q&A. Uh, you know, my uh, profile on LinkedIn, you can uh, ping me separately afterwards and stuff for that. But thank you so much for having me over. Thank you. Thank you, Vijay. Thank you for giving us the insights of uh, how uh, retail and uh, online uh, retail uh, works differently at uh, you know, the various uh, organizations. So we are now open uh, for a Q&A uh, session. Uh, attendees who have any questions can uh, type, type it on the chat option that's available on the console. Um, and then we'll have uh, the presenters uh, pick up those questions and uh, you know, give you suitable replies. So there's a chat option on the console which you can utilize for sharing your questions. Okay, uh, we have our first question by uh, Maruti and his question is, uh, which tool is best for uh, visualization? Uh, uh, like Power BI, Tableau, or is there any other tool that uh, is suggested for uh, visualization in particular? 
I think Shankar. Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think I would say my favorite tool is you know either a Power BI or Tableau. Tableau is the easiest to use, but it's also more expensive. So organizations sometimes shy away from uh, buying Tableau licenses. Power BI is you know reasonably easy to use, but it has some feature limitations compared to Tableau. However, I think when you talk about which tool is the best to use, you, you want to start with Tableau and Power BI, but if you're getting a little bit deeper into analytics, you may want to consider some of the more modern libraries, but that require coding. For example, you know, Plotly is a great example of a, a visualization library that helps you still get some of the features of Tableau, such as tool tips, you know, reactions to clicks and so on. However, it requires some amount of coding. So I would offer that I mean, if you look at my toolkit today of visualization tools, I use Tableau. I use Orange. Orange is uh, not just a visualization show, tool, it's a data workbench. I also use Gluviz, especially when I'm dealing with, uh, you know, industrial IoT data. Uh, I also use Plotly. So those are my four uh, go-to tools. Okay, okay. Thank you, Shankar. Uh, we have another question uh, from Rahul Sinha. Uh, his question is uh, how Indian retail market is uh, evolving uh, using analytics. It's a very generic question, but I'm sure uh, no, Vijay would be able to answer this on how Indian retail is uh, evolving using analytics uh, as a technology. Yes, sounds good. So, uh, look, from speaking to my friends in most Indian retail companies, uh, you know, there's there's, there's uh, two big advantages that Indian retail companies face as compared to their more traditional counterparts in the US, right? One is that uh, the whole exercise in terms of data collection, data curation is far easier because a lot of them have started investing heavily into you know data and technology practices and therefore they don't have probably the challenges of a uh, you know traditional retail in terms of everything running on mainframe and you know a lot of time spent in just you know gathering data more than anything else right so uh, they, they we, at least from speaking to my friends there's much faster adoption in terms of things like adopting cloud and stuff like that right so that's from the technology perspective but from a retail perspective i think uh, indian retailers as far as i've seen are very very fast in terms of adopting uh, analytics are much more open in terms of experimentation right so you look at some of the things that flipkart has been doing uh, you know i'm sure uh, my friend from altebilla can kind of talk about some of the things that they're doing from a retail perspective but they are much more experimentative and much more open to newer ideas in terms of what they do so all of the use cases that i spoke about will definitely be there i'm assuming in a lot of the indian retailers uh, and I'm sure they'll be more as, uh, and, and they're very, very quick at learning lessons from some of the uh, wins and failures in the US and the UK and the folk. I don't know if that answers the question. I'm, I'm happy to kind of talk about more detail. Uh, there's several use cases that they are using for sure, uh, which I'm happy to talk about later. Okay, okay, got it, got it. Thank you, Vijay. Uh, and, and the next question is from Ankit Gupta. Uh, he's asking uh, as to how do you see the future of auto machine learning? Uh, because as per the growth demand, one cannot code model every day. How will data science uh, go in automated uh, mode in the near future? Uh, would Sandeep, would you be able to take this up? If you like, to, I can repeat the question. I can kind of talk about that. Couple of use cases, if that's all right. This is sure. Vijay here. Sure, Vijay. Sure. Yeah. So, uh, so look, Lowe's perspective towards auto ML is the following, right? So, there are algorithms, let's say, for example, that have been built by Amazon or Google or Microsoft in this case, uh, which, uh, frankly, you know, they are probably the best at building simply because they have access to data. Uh, from multiple use cases across industries. So let me give you an example, right? So they have algorithms around, let's say, facial recognition, or they have algorithms around recommender systems, or they have algorithms around other things. So our perspective around auto ML is that, you know, for use cases that are generic, we might end up using their algorithms and kind of uh, make it flexible for our use. 
but anything for us which is more strategic let's say for example pricing and promotion strategy which is unique to us our supply chain strategy which is unique to us that's where we are building algorithms from scratch because that gives us a strategic advantage some of the more generic things we are tilting towards order okay okay rajesh can you hear me yes shankar please go ahead no this sorry, sorry. can you hear me yeah. okay yes. cool sorry uh, again connection I, i got back so uh, in addition to what um, um, shankar said so here's here's my take right uh, as a platform provider as microsoft i can i can um, speak from that context so technology to great extent has been getting you know democratized specifically ai so automated machine learning or auto ml what you call it uh, will definitely get richer and richer uh, today as a technology provider we support let's say regression classification forecasting uh, clustering may come in soon but i think going forward while it is getting democratized to a greater extent uh, automated to you know as a synonym um, it is also very important for us to address model explainability right uh, we can call it intelligibility as a as a construct there and for us to do that you definitely need to bring in bring in that core algorithmic knowledge to decipher yes model is the the automation is giving me some output so should what is is it the best output is the most optimized model so i think there is more knowledge essential in individual that is required for us to decipher that but technology will definitely be democratized to a greater extent okay thank you thank you sandeep uh the next question is by shiva uh, he is actually a marketer with almost uh, 14 years of experience uh, and he's also uh, you know started his own venture now now his question is uh, where should uh, he start in the data world in terms of uh, learning the basics of uh, data science should he start with learning uh, programming languages like r python or is there anything uh, that he has to forgot to begin his journey here yeah um rajesh can i take that and probably let's can add as well yeah sure okay so i i can probably relate this to um you know my my batch at isb right if i can best put an example there uh when i sat through the classroom um right uh, th- there were people with varied experiences you know there were half of them had analytics background some of them from had a you know, management background they were all marketers so i think um it's an even playground all of us start with and and to your question uh should i start with a b or c which is python or etc i think uh, i would not look at it that way i would look at holistically in terms of if i trying to break into the world of data science right um you need a level playing ground and i would say an academic inter- intervention like the program that we're talking about will give you that level playing ground because you know you can learn technology any day i think that's probably is the most simple thing on this planet trust me as a technology company i can say that but the most important one is building a perspective on how to solve problem and that can only come in by uh, by your investment of time in and in in in, in an academic intervention we're speaking about right now um so i would i would say you know don't look at uh, should i learn python or any language look at holistically how can i bring in that perspective into uh, or build vocabulary in terms of solving problems leveraging data science and techniques yeah okay okay sure sure thank you uh, sandeep uh, we have another question uh, this is uh, mostly Uh, yeah, this is more more towards the program at ISP. Uh, this gentleman would like to know what exactly is the admission process uh, for ISP and uh, what is the kind of class profile uh, that the uh, AB AAM PBA program uh, in particular has. I think uh, Rajesh would be able to take this up. Mm, I, I think there is a technical problem. We are not able to hear Rajesh. Uh, I think we can move on to the next question. uh now uh, we have uh, mr harish uh, he, his question is is there any analytics or data science certification that is uh, you know recognized by the industry industry uh, like a pmp or a six sigma bet certification is there any is there any you know standard fixed certification or a certification uh, that the industry recognizes here it is a shankar i can take a stab at it yeah Uh, no, uh, Mr. Harish. No, I don't think I know of any. Uh, and looking at the recruitment profiles that I've been receiving, 
uh, most of the certifications we see are given only by individual universities either like isb or insofi or um, you know great lakes and you know institutes like i am however uh, we are i am not aware and uh, uh, while it's a good question and you know i'm maybe somebody else has an answer to that i would also offer to you that uh, when you're looking at proving yourself in the analytic domain through a certification one of the things i know that the industry looks at very carefully is if you're able to participate in competitions like a kaggle competition or you know machine learning mastery competition and show that you've been able to participate in a global competition and secure a good ranking so if you're looking to stand out definitely certification is one way to go and another way to go is competitions sure thank you thank you shankar uh, and this is open to uh, all the speakers uh, present. Uh, this is Deepanshu and his question is, uh, what is the next big uh, idea, uh, you know, for the whole world? Uh, is essentially what he's trying to ask is, can there be a revolutionizing idea that the sector in your perspective would help uh, focus on industry trends and growth? Interesting one. Um, I have a perspective. Can I can I go? Sure, sure, sir. Sure. Um, I think this is a very broad question, but um, uh, considering you know we're talking about uh, in, in the overall construct of uh, uh, data and data science and and uh, ability for us to solve some of the larger societal problems, um, I would say one of the promise that we have for the future. I'm when I say promise. Uh, we're talking about you know, five, five to eight years timeline um, is definitely quantum computing um, right today um, in the world of machine learning um, you know having a large i mean we're still uh, getting to an extent where we are building data corpuses but imagine you have a large data corpus you want to solve something you know the real world problem uh, it takes it takes a supercomputer to literally crack it down so we're talking about in the next 48 years something like quantum computing which is the next level of computing which will probably help us um, solve problems which probably will take months and years now uh, in in hours going forward so i think that's a promise that holds uh, true for all of us but hence interesting times here in terms of ability for us to take on a uh, lot of societal problems and solve them so i would say that's my perspective not really mentioning some of the trends in terms of be it uh, blockchain is going to transform the world in terms of uh, no hunger world peace etc i'm not going to go in that zone but in terms of uh, the promise uh, in tying a pretty close uh, thread to um, ai and ml i think quantum has the next power that each one each each one required to solve those problems thanks sandeep sandeep can you hear me yeah can hear you if, is if the rajesh yeah yes yes yeah okay i I, I will uh, great uh, Pradeep, uh, if you permit me, I can take the previous question. There was some reason for perhaps I wasn't audible as earlier. Sure, sure, sure. Please go ahead. Uh, the question is about the okay. admission process and the class profile of uh, AMPB uh, program. Okay. So uh, regarding the admission process, it's a very simple and straightforward procedure. You make an online application at the ISB uh, on the ISB portal. Uh, we conduct an online test when you don't have an, uh, you know, supporting GMAT or a GRE or a CAD score. And this online test predominantly is just to give us at the team at ISB an idea as to where you stand in your current learnability. It's not an eliminating factor, but it gives us some kind of a view. See, uh, in one of the earlier questions, Sandeep had mentioned about the diversity. Vijay had touched upon it, what he had seen in the class. So the, the diversity, you know, we have people with two to three years experience. We have people with 20, 25 years of experience. In one of the classes, you know, in fact, there was a joke going around as well that the experience of the guy who has the highest experience is more than the age of the guy who is the least experienced. So that's the kind of diversity that we have around. So that's where this online test serves as an indicator to us to see where a particular person can be pegged at. And then there would be an interview where we would understand your objectives of doing this particular program. And as long as they are in line with what we have at ISB, we are pretty open to you know have you in the class. Now, there, there is a decent selectivity ratio. And uh, that's because you know we expect that any person, uh, he or she who 
envisages themselves to be a part of the class that is uh, at ISB, we need to see what value proposition that he will bring to the table so that he can contribute or she can contribute to the peer learning of the entire class. So it is a very well known classic thing that you know ISB has a world class infrastructure, best in faculty, pre academicians, people who really are best in the industry come and speak and all. But what is unsaid totally is that we also attract the best students and thereby the amount of peer learning that happens between students to students is something that we really, really take great pride in and that's why the class is what it is. So the process is what I just mentioned and regarding the class profile, I think already Sandeep did make an indirect reference on it that in his class, he had people with management background, he had people with technical background, he had people with, so I will just add to that. We do uh, see the class experience uh, average, I mean, I think in the past few batches, 13, 14 batches that we have seen down here, it has been closer to seven to nine years of an experience at an average. And uh, we have seen people, uh, you know, uh, who are from telecom, banking and financial services industry, uh, you know, pure hardcore coders, pure, uh, people who are working on the front end systems, people who are from healthcare domain, marketeers, people who are from, uh, you know, I think uh, uh, minerals and mines, I can go on actually. So there is not any specific industry I feel or I believe strongly where, you know, analytics as such has not pro proliferated as yet. So we do have a healthy representation signifying each of these kind of sectors and a very rich experience. So, you know, when, as you let's assume that a person, uh, a junior person can talk about how he has done a regression model, for example, a senior person like Sandeep may throw in his hat and say that where they used, you know, the regression perhaps to solve an issue. And then, you know, a use case uh, can be talked by Vijay or someone as to how they have used it in their company. So the classroom discussions are something that, you know, people really really take back and the fondest of memories and uh, they are not really limited to the classes that happen at ISB but they are also the, 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 the people I'm sure you know Sandeep and Vijay will vouch for it as a class they have been in touch with their colleagues and the peers and alumni as alumni they have uh, benefited immensely from the network that you know ISB gives them so this is uh, I think a long answer to a short question Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Rajesh, for clarifying uh, those uh, pointers about the admission process at ISP. Uh, uh, I, I think uh, there's one interesting question. I, I think we are a little uh, overshooting the time, but uh, anybody can take this up. Uh, this is open for all panelists. Uh, the question is by Mukun, and his question is: As analytics leaders uh, in the current scenario, uh, what kind of effect do you? C for C, uh, especially for the Indian service industry because of uh, the coronavirus situation that's prevailing uh, currently. I can take a shot at it, Pradeep. Sure. 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 Yeah. Yeah. No, I think definitely there is going to be some short-term impact in some of our service professionals not able to travel to their client sites. But that said, we are, our group here internally at Altibilla Group, we are kind of an internal services group. And uh, we have found ways to now work more digitally uh, without disrupting too much of our schedules. Yes, some customer touch points will be missing. And uh, in a way, we feel that this is a good reset uh, in, you know, in, in some customers' cases, for example, their face-to-face -face need was much higher. This is uh, forced them to work through a new way of work, digital way of working, which you know, which is what we were trying to promote ourselves. And unfortunately, through this method, um, it has happened. However, uh, we, I, I believe it's a good thing for the industry to learn how to work more digitally, especially in a country like India, in a place like Bangalore, where there is so much traffic congestion, we are uh, unnecessarily you know, burning away a very valuable petroleum every day in the in you know in the traffic. So. Uh, I'm looking forward actually to the next few weeks and seeing how this is going to, uh, our industry is going to cope up with this new style of working. Sure, thank you. Thank you, Shankar. So folks, uh, with that, I think we have come to the uh, end of the session. It's been uh, great having uh, you know, with panelists Sandeep uh, from Microsoft. Thank you very much uh, for your inputs, uh, shows and Vijay and Ayur. Uh, thank you very much for taking time off uh, and uh, addressing our, our attendees and 
uh, Shankar, Shivrava, Krishnan uh, from Aditya Birla Group. Thank you. Thanks a lot. And uh, nonetheless, uh, uh, Rajesh uh, for answering all questions pertaining to uh, ISP program. So it's been a pleasure hosting uh, all of you uh, panelists and uh, the attendees over this online masterclass session. And we hope to you know, uh, meet up all of you uh, again, either on online format or on a physical event uh, in the near future. So thank you once again.